Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Good evening, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. Welcome to this evening's continuation of the Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. This series is presented by the College of Arts and Sciences and the University of Washington Alumni Association and is funded by a generous endowment from Alan L. Edwards. The topics in this series illustrate how psychological research serves humanity. This, the University of Washington receives more research support than any other public university in the nation. The psychology department alone receives nearly $10 million annually in research support that helps us advance our knowledge of basic science, directly serve people in our community and around the globe, and train our undergraduates and graduate students. Tonight's lecture addresses suicidal individuals, evaluation, therapies, and ethics. Our next speaker is Dr. Marcia Linehan. Dr. Linehan is a professor of psychology here at the University of Washington. She is the founder and since 1980, the director of the Behavioral Research and Therapy Clinics, which is a consortium of research projects developing and evaluating new treatments for severely disordered uh, and multi-diagnostic populations. Her primary research is in the application of behavioral models to suicidal behaviors drug abuse, and borderline personality disorder. She's also working to transfer effective treatment from research settings to the clinical community. Dr. Linehan has received a long list of awards and honors recognizing both her clinical and research contributions. She's also held esteemed positions in several national professional organizations and is currently president of the Society of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychological Association. Dr. Linehan has written three books, including two treatment man manuals for borderline personality disorder. She's published extensively in scientific journals and has a long history of grant support for her research. Her books have been translated into German, French, Italian, Dutch, and Swedish. And together with her tireless work in training clinicians from around the world in the therapeutic techniques she has developed, have propelled her truly national truly international impact on the treatment of suicidal behaviors, drug abuse, and borderline personality disorder. Please help me welcome Dr. Marsha Linehan. Well, thank you very much. I am delighted to be here because I must tell you, you know, I, my suicide and suicide research and the treatment of suicide and the development and transmission of new treatments for suicide really is the passion of my professional life. And I have spent, in fact, my entire professional life on this project. And I want to start by saying that, you know, no one can do this work alone. And I want to just note who has helped me this is the Behavioral Research and Therapy Clinics, uh, our scientific staff. We began as the Suicidal Behaviors Research Clinic many, many, many years ago. And uh, we've expanded because we've included borderline personality disorder, drug abuse, eating disorders, and other things. So we changed our name. 
But at core and at home, we've always been the Suicidal Behaviors Research Clinic. Uh, I want to also thank the major players at the University of Washington. I am indeed unbelievably fortunate. Uh, I didn't actually realize how fortunate until I started hearing what happens to other people at other universities. But I am unbelievably fortunate that the Human Subjects Division at this university has been willing to change, to take risks, to learn from me and to teach me how to write a grant, how to write an application. My research, for the most part, looks for the highest risk for suicide people in town. We call the hospitals and say, who's the worst? Highest risk, we'll take them. We look for that, and I am purely, solely, completely, and totally beginning to end a research program, a treatment development research program. And human subjects, therefore, practically approves of every breath that I take. And they have approved of all of my research. I have never been turned down. Now, I must say, I feel like I've gone and lived with them to get things approved. But I have never ultimately been turned down, except on those occasions when they were right. <laughs> and then, OK. I changed what I was doing. I also want to thank the Office of Sponsored Program. It used to be grants and contracts, which is how I think of them still. But I do have to say that I could never have done the research that I do without funding, particularly from the National Institute of Health. I, I'm funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Drug Abuse, both of which have a, 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 a big interest in suicide research and trying to find people to put those grants in. And the reason I have to thank them is that they did send a letter once to the psychology department <laughs> saying, could you please get her to get her proposals in before 5 o'clock on the last day when we close, <laughs> rather than coming at five minutes after 5 when we close. But I must tell you, even though they sent the letter, they sent the grant too. <laughs> and uh, those who know me know that it's possible I wouldn't be funded if they hadn't done all that good stuff for me. And the Department of Psychology, you have to really think I'm their main suicide, oh, well, I'm kind of their only suicide researcher. And I brought it, you know, the average psychology, one of the tragedies in this country is the average psychology department does not take high risk suicidal people. Ours uh, did not either, mostly does not now. Um, high risk suicidal people are, of course, given to what I view as largely untrained medical residents who are just throwing the suicidal person and said, treat them. But psychology, the people who mostly do the development of new uh, non-medical treatments, uh, almost across the country are not allowed to see suicidal people. And uh, I mean, not allowed in training. And so I'm here at the University of Washington, and I began all my research with young, uh, poor little graduate students who happened to be my students. And I said, you know, look, those high-risk people I was calling that hospital about, my students are going to see them. And I had one student who had a patient who used to call her. This was a third-year graduate student. The patient would call her and the, was clicking the gun in the background uh, while she was on the telephone. This happens to be, uh, you know, we've had others where they brought their guns into therapy. and. Uh, which we do confiscate. You know, the University of Washington <laughs> has given me a special permit to confiscate weapons. And the, so the Department of Psychology has been, uh, you know, psychologically supportive in the sense that they've allowed me to actually just set up my own training clinic. And I'm somewhat, uh, not totally under the radar, especially not after tonight, but <laughs> they really haven't given me grief. They haven't told me I had to stop doing all this with students. And I appreciate that, because without students to stand on your shoulders, you've got nowhere to go. Lest you think that we've had an impact on suicide, this is worldwide suicide, global suicide rates from 1950 to 2000. So not only have rates not gone down, that's pretty bad right there, but if you notice, rates, particularly in males, have actually gone up. In the United States, over 30,000 die by suicide a year. Approximately 500,000 emergency room, emergency department visits 
for suicide attempts per year, and more die, almost twice as many people die from suicide as die by homicide. It's the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. As you can see, third for ages 15 to 24, up to eighth for ages 45 to 64. This fourth leading cause of death for people 25 to 44. It's really amazing when you think about it. It's the eighth leading cause for men, 17th for women. So what can we conclude? Of course, we can only conclude that suicidal behavior is a major public health problem. It's really a un major, major unmet public health problem. So let's look at mental illness or mental disorders and suicide. So this is a review of 83 mortalities, 83 studies of why people die. Uh, schizophrenics, 4% suicide rate, 4%. Depression, bipolar disorders, when you put them together, it's around 6%. Addiction disorders, 7%. Borderline personality disorder, which is very interesting because borderline personality disorder has only been recently uh, really been studied in any great depth. Has a, uh, the research would suggest between 8 and 10 percent. It may only be around 5 or 6 percent. There's a huge overlap, of course, borderline personality disorder in, in our research. Around 87 to 90 percent meet criteria for major depression. And many of them meet criteria for addiction disorders. And uh, so it's possible that you've, what you've really got is people with multiple disorders have high suicide rates. So the only conclusion one can make here, because the rates of suicide in the general population are around 11, uh, each year 11 per 100,000. So in other words, nowhere close to 5, 4, or 5 percent kill themselves. So we have to assume and see in our data the suicidal behavior is associated with severe and persistent mental disorders. That is not to say that every person who kills himself has a severe and persistent mental disorder. We actually know that that is not true. But it's far more likely if you've got a severe and persistent mental disorder, which is how the mental health people are actually in the ball game of trying to figure out what to do. So the question then is, is does treatment research tell us anything? So what I am a treatment development researcher. That's what I've done my whole career, and that's what I'm still trying to do right now is develop treatments. So the question is, if we look at the treatment research, does it tell us anything? Now, the first thing you need to know is the standard model of care is a medical model. The medical model says that suicidal behavior is a symptom of a mental disorder. So behavior is a symptom of a disorder. And the thinking goes here that if you treat the disorder, suicide risk will go down. Now remember, the association of suicidal behavior with mental disorder is just that, an association. It does not say that the disorder causes it. We don't know why they're associated. We simply know they are. But the belief in the, in the standard care has been that you must treat the disorder. And if you do that, you, this will pay off. So what's the data? The first thing I'll ask is, does treatment of depression with antidepressant medications, so underline the word medication here, reduce the risk of suicidal behavior? Now, the gold standard research is what's called double-blind randomized clinical trials. What that is, a double-blind means that the person who's taking the medication and the person who's giving the medication don't know whether you're getting a medication, and if so, which medication, or whether you're getting a placebo. And a placebo is like getting a sugar pill. Okay, in other words, it has no known efficacy. Outside of the fact that the very fact that you think you're taking a pill turns out to be extraordinarily efficacious. Um, and randomized clinical trial means that it's a clinical trial. In other words, you actually get treatment. But you're randomized to one condition or another. And when you're randomized, it means that the difference between randomized and choosing, if you choose your treatment, we, you can never really know for sure whether certain kinds of people choose one treatment and certain kinds choose another. And that the real reason the treatment works is not because of the treatment, but because the people who choose the treatment are different. And that's why the gold standard is randomized clinical trials. And if, if you get nothing out of this, this entire talk, 
getting the idea that you should pay attention to randomized clinical trials, I'll feel that my task is somewhat done. Okay, this is 17 antidepressant trials. This was a person who did a review of 17 trials, and every trial was comparing placebo, that old sugar pill, to some other treatment. Now, Prozac was one of them, and, and there were others. Now, although the main point I want to make to you here is that, and this was the percent of suicides, the main point I want to make, it looks like placebo had less. But that is not the case because it could have occurred by chance. One of the good things about statistics, they may do all sorts of other things for you that you don't like, but they can tell you if there's a difference, is that by chance or is that something we should really pay attention to? So you can often get a difference and it's non-significant, and that's what the NS means, non-significant. And that means if you redid the experiment, the next time it could come out just the opposite. So even though it looks different, because it certainly does look different, you want to remind yourself that, all, that it could, if you ran the whole, all those experiments again, they could have gone the opposite. The very interesting thing about Beasley, though, was he then went and looked and thought, well, maybe the antidepressants didn't work. Let's look and see if the people that it did work for, maybe they had fewer suicides. And what he found was that whether the antidepressant worked or didn't work, you were finding the same results. Okay, so that's one. The next is the FDA sample. This is where they took the, the incidents reported by the people doing them, primarily the drug companies. And as we know, the reports from a drug company may or may not be terribly accurate. They could be an overestimation of suicide or an underestimation. The important thing for our purposes is that if they were making mistakes, they were making the same kind of mistakes in every different condition. So this is looking at placebos again versus investigational drugs and, what, and the drug they were comparing. Comparing drugs usually is the drug that was used previously. And what you see here once again is your placebo looks less. Do not, you know, I sometimes hesitate to show this kind of data because it makes you think, oh my God, we should all take placebos. <laughs> but the point I want to make is it's non-significant. That means that we, if you re-ran everything, it could have gone the other way. So what about schizophrenia? Well, why don't, maybe if we treated schizophrenia, because they have a high suicide rate, at, especially at some critical periods. What about that? So they looked at the FDA trials there also, and what they found here was, here you've got the placebo looks like, oh my gosh, this is, this is bad, because that's for suicide. Don't give placebo. So once again, I want to remind you that if you re-ran the experiment, it could go the opposite. And suicide attempts, it looks like, oh, placebos look good now. But remember, that's non-significant also. So the main thing that we've got here is that you have to ask yourself, is you, if you treat the disorder, will the suicide risk go down? Maybe not. That's really all we can say, maybe not. We can't say that it will go down or it won't go down. Why? Up to two-thirds. In some er sometimes it might be more, uh, exclude individuals at high risk for suicide. When I review grants, I always find it interesting. I read the little who they're excluding from the study, and it never mentions suicide, very rarely. And then you go into their safety precautions, which everyone has to put in a grant proposal, and suddenly you say, we will not take unsafe people. And the unsafe people are anyone who looks like they have a risk for suicide. So I figure there are two groups that we have no idea how to treat, suicide and pregnant women, <laughs> because they're excluded from every study, practically. Now, how high risk you have to be is very different. Some of them are only if it looks like you're high risk, do they take you out. Others, if you seem risky. Others, if you seem less. And what's very interesting about it is it is such a given that we even know who's high risk, that people don't even have to define who's high risk when they say they're excluding high risk. So not only are they excluding people, we actually don't know who they're excluding. So we don't really even know who our treatments are good for. This is a problem. The new model of care, which I think is what I would call the emerging model of care, 
It's been my model of care I have to tell you from the beginning, but not everybody else's model of care from the beginning, is that suicidal behavior is disordered behavior. It's best viewed as a problem itself rather than a symptom of some different problem. And that if you want to reduce suicidal behavior, you should treat the behavior. So what's the evidence that that's a good idea? What about medication trials? treating suicidal behaviors. So I'm going to tell you the following. There are five medication trials that have selected people for the trial because they were high risk. OK, five. Compare this to the thousands that have excluded everybody. And you've got only five. And what we know from that trials is next to nothing, as far as I can tell. Because the trial, the only trial with reasonably significant findings was a comparison of two antipsychotic drugs with schizophrenics at high risk for suicide. And what they found was the suicide rate of suicidal behavior was lower with one antipsychotic compared to another. Now, given the fact that we're ordinarily going to want to give antipsychotic medication, to a person with schizophrenia, that's important information to know that one medication may be more protective than the other. But I do want to po uh, point out to you that it, does, it says that one, if you compare only these two, one is better than the other. But that's really all it tells you. So what I'm going to talk about now is dialectical behavior therapy and behavior therapy for high-risk suicidal clients. The reason I'm going to talk to you about this is because there are almost no psychosocial interventions, but I must say many more psychosocial interventions than there are medic med uh, medication interventions for suicidal behavior. When I've done my literature reviews, it used to be that there were only 25. When I wrote my first it was 26. It's now, I think, maybe a little bit more than 30, maybe up to 35 studies. Uh, that are selecting people for being suicidal. The worst case scenario, though, and here's what goes on, it's hard to me to believe that this is really what happens, is that you've got your studies for highly suicidal people, except that they exclude high risk for suicide from a randomized trial of a treatment for suicidal people. And high risk then get excluded. So there's quite a few that do that. But more importantly, then they've got the ones that say, we'll exclude people who have a diagnosed mental disorder. But this is a study of suicidal people. So in other words, even the studies of suicidal people start getting rid of most of the suicidal people in the studies. So it's very difficult to know what those studies are really treating themselves. Now, this is not true for everybody, but it's true for quite a bit. So the real reason I'm going to talk to you about dialectic behavior therapy is that I figured some of you might be actually here to hear about dialectic behavior therapy. And I actually wrote an entire talk without it in, and then I thought, why not? So I'll talk about dialectic behavior therapy. And it is a therapy for high-risk suicidal clients. This is a treatment that was developed in the first place for high-risk suicidal clients. Now, the reason it's called dialectical behavior therapy is because I first tried behavior therapy. OK, and behavior therapy can be thought of as a technology of change. This is the important thing to keep in mind, technology of change. The model here is that suicidal behavior is problem-solving behavior for the client and is a problem for the therapist. You know, if you really think about who is suicidal behavior a problem for, usually it is rarely that the client thinks it's a problem. Usually it's the therapist who thinks it's a problem. Generally, suicidal behavior solves the problem of unbearable emotional anguish. Now, it's related to various kinds of anguish. It's related to the anguish, you know, there's a very high rate with schizophrenic males in particular when they first find out the diagnosis, which is surely a time of excruciating anguish. It's highly related to bipolar disorder, which by all accounts is a, a disorder of anguish. 
And it's related to depression. And it's related to borderline personality disorder, which has really been my area of research. And I'll speak about that in a moment. But it's an area of unbearable emotional anguish. When I started the research, I started it purely to treat suicidal individuals. I found later, uh, I, I found later that the people I was treating, because I was so wanting to be sure I was treating high risk for suicide people, that I decided I would get people who had tried to kill themselves a lot of times under the theory that they would be higher risk and also that if, I, if they were trying it a lot, I could, I could show that I could get them to stop. And um, it turns out that people who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder, one of their distinctive characteristics is that they often have histories of multiple suicide attempts. They have multiple intentional self-entries, which may or may not be, which are not suicidal, and multiple attempts to kill themselves. And as you saw earlier, they also end up dead from suicide. They have a high rate of ending up dead. I mean, you've got to remember, suicide means being dead. Uh, it's important to keep that in mind. So, so the notion is it solves the problem. Now, we've done some research in our lab on this whole issue of what's the effect of trying to kill yourself. And we've looked at the effect of self-entry. We've looked at the effect of a mad, a suicide attempts. But in research, you cannot say to someone, I want to study suicide attempts. Please attempt suicide so I can study it. <laughs> so the only thing that we could do was get people, look at their previous behavior, and get them to imagine it. And as we were doing that, we were having people imagine a time when they had intentionally uh, harm themselves, and we had a control condition of when they accidentally harm themselves. So then we wanted to have them imagine when they, people who had attempted suicide, the, the time, last time that they had attempted suicide. So I wanted a control condition for that, so I thought, well, we'll put, let's put in accidental death. And we made up a scenario of accidental death where we t had people imagine a highly stressful event. Then we had them imagine that they wanted to go, they got a headache out of the stress, they felt so terrible, and they were so upset, and they went and they were so upset they just grabbed a bottle which they thought was something for the headache, and after they'd taken it, they discovered that it was poisonous and was very likely to kill them. And we were monitoring what went on while they're imagining this, and we were shocked by what we found. And these were people who had histories of suicidal behavior, so we weren't out here in the public. And they also met criteria for borderline personality disorder, which is the disorder most associated with suicidal behavior. And what we found when we looked at skin conductance, we found that skin conductance, which went high as a marker for arousal, we found that the person it went got very high under stress, as you can see up here for stress. And it stayed very high as they were approaching taking the medicine. And as soon as they took the medicine and thought they were dying, they started getting relaxed. And we found the same thing in another measure, uh, another marker of emotion regulation, which is called vagal tone. And we found the exact same thing, that when they uh, thought that they were dying, Vagal tone, in this case, when it goes up, it means that you're regulating emotions, that they're, they're, they're getting regulated. And then we looked at negative emotions in their self-reports, and we found the same thing, that negative um, emotions went down. Now, the worrisome part of this was, we were also always measuring at the end how, what the urges to kill themselves were. And in this particular script, urges to kill themselves always went up afterwards. And we realized that what we might have found was really how suicide ideation is functioning. The suicide ideation itself is what, a thing that makes a person feel better. It's like, I can't get out. I can't escape. Suggesting that su even suicide ideation can be a behavior that reduces emotional anguish momentarily. And it's when it stops momentarily working that you're at extreme risk for suicide. 
So as I went in to work on these people, remember I had my technology of change. So what happened was I came in with my focus on change to a person who's extremely upset. So imagine yourself when you're at your most upset, when someone then comes in and rather than listening to you, validating you, soothing you, or saying, yeah, that's really awful, says, okay, let me help you change right this minute. Okay, which is essentially what happened. I came in with a, oh, let me help you change right this minute. At which point arousal went up, sense of being out of control went up, and the high arousal, how to control meant no learning, no collaboration. So this was a shock, but ever flexible, I switched to acceptance. <laughs> Except that when I went to acceptance, the very same thing happened. I said, oh yes, I can see it's really terrible. Oh my gosh, this is the worst. And what happened was, the more acceptance I did, it was like, wait a minute, you're not validating my pain. You're accepting my pain. If you knew how bad it was, you would try to help me. <laughs> and I was saying, oh, don't worry, I will. Let me go to change. And I'd switch back to change, at which point I'd have to switch back to acceptance. And I'd go back and forth and back and forth. And what came out of that was the treatment that actually was developed to balance acceptance with change where the therapist had to actively accept the client where they were. And with suicidal clients, accept the unbelievable risk that you were sitting there with. Because part of what happens is the therapists themselves get extraordinarily aroused too, and anxious and fearful, and start trying to control the client. So the therapist had to practice acceptance while at the same time and really simultaneously focusing on helping the client change. Accepting that life was untenable and managing to help the client make, make a change. But the next problem came up which was, I for the most part don't exclude anyone in my research. I exclude some, I exclude people who are psychotic or bipolar disorder, mainly because you really need medication with those two, and I've been developing behavioral treatments and did not want to be required to give medications. So, but I have major depression, we have panic disorder, we have, um, we have, we have 3.1 other disorders besides borderline personality disorder and suicidal behavior. And so what happens is you have a person who has multiple problems. Now the problem with a person who has multiple problems is you can't work on all the problems at the same time. When you've got multiple problems, you've got to accept a few problems to work on other problems. The problem with my clients was they had low distress tolerance, which meant that as I started to work on one problem, they would immediately say, but this other problem is too bad, I got to work on that. I would switch over to that one and they say, no, you've got to work on this. I'd switch over to that, it's like, no, now I've got to get a job. Now I've got to work on my relationship. Now this, now that, now this, now that. And I would switch, 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 and then the client would say, well, I'll kill myself. And I'd say, okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> so what I had to do I had to figure out a way to teach the clients the very same behaviors I was having to teach myself and the therapist I was training. I had to teach myself to accept and change, but I had to teach the clients the same thing. I had to teach them both how to change, but also how to accept themselves. And the dialectic is the tension between those two. So dialectical behavior therapy balances Change and acceptance. It does a lot of problem solving. It's really at its heart and its soul problem solving treatment with validation. It balances consulting to the patient, which is, I will not do it for you. I will tell you how to do it. No, I won't make that phone call. No, I'm not going to do this for you. You hate your psychiatrist and want me to call them and tell them to shape up. I'm not doing it, but pick up the phone and I'll coach you through that call with doing it for them. You know, the best model 
of a therapist who's a really good therapist is the parent with the child in the um, shopping mall. I'm always amazed when I watch them. So you watch the parent with the little child who's wandering all over the place, going nowhere fast, doing this. And I watch the marvelous patience of these parents who can accept and walk and let their kid walk. The other times when the kid falls and these parents stand there and wait for this kid to get up. And surely there's a time too when your child falls, hits their head hard, crying, screaming, and what does the parent do? Do they stand there and say, wait for you to get up? No, the parent goes, soothes, helps, and assists. So there's the time for both, and a therapist has to balance them. With suicidal people, in my opinion, and all of our opinions, there's been such an overbearing emphasis on taking care of them, doing it for them, taking them out, putting them in hospitals, et cetera, that, that dialectic behavior therapy went the other way and said, our modal operation will be to not do things for them, and we will um, only under extreme circumstances with a certain set of guidelines, are we going to move in and take over? So we have two kinds of communication styles. One's irreverence, treading where angels fear to tread style. And the other is the warm reciprocal style that almost all therapists are taught. The reason that irreverence actually turns out to be very important is there's a lot of research that novel stimuli uh, create deeper learning. And irreverence is novel stimuli. What are the functions? I just want to say that, so the treatment focuses on five things. Improving capabilities, improving motivation. You know, it does you no know good to have skills if, it's, if the skills are punished. If every time you do something you get punished, you're not going to do the behavior. So the therapist has to work to make sure that the reinforcers for adaptive behavior are there and that dysfunctional behavior, suicidal behavior, other kinds of dysfunctional behavior, drug abuse, all the behaviors that are making their lives chaotic are not reinforced. It does you no good to have a, have a skill if you're too afraid to use it, too ashamed to use it, so you have to work on the emotions that interfere with skill behavior. And it does you no good to have a skill if you don't believe it would ever do you any good. If you have no belief, if your beliefs are faulty, if you believe that if I ask for a job, I'll never get one. So you're going to have to work on their beliefs. DBT does that too. You've got to make sure that new behavior generalizes out to the real world. It does you no good to learn behavior with a therapist if you can't use it anywhere else. One of the major problems with inpatient treatment is that there appear to be very serious problems with the behaviors that one learns on an inpatient unit generalizing out to anywhere else. I don't have time to go into that data now, but I, I cut. You've got to structure the environment so it reinforces new behaviors. We bring families in a lot, bring friends in sometimes because you, if you're trying to teach a person something and they go back into an environment, this is particularly true with our drug addicts where we send a person out to, to, into a drug using environment and the other people laugh or hate you if you give up drugs or if you give up alcohol, both of which are highly related to ending up dead, either from an overdose that's accidental or an overdose that's on purpose. Some people live in environments where the only way anything comes their way is if they're suicidal. That being suicidal is the only way anyone ever actually hears the anguish of their lives. And finally, I think sometimes when I'm dead and buried, if people look back on my career and say, what did she contribute? They're going to say, this is what I did contribute, which is the focus of increasing skills and motivation of therapists. I can't begin to tell you how important it is with a suicidal person to keep a therapist on track. Therapists are terrified, in this country in particular, because you can be sued so easily. 
therapists believe that they'll be blamed, believe that they could not tolerate a suicide. The rules of engagement are such that you're required, or many people think you are required, to do standard of care. And as I've already told you, and you might not know, there, there's no evidence for standard of care. The standard of care is to hospitalize. There's not one single solitary study that's ever been done that's shown that inpatient treatment kept anyone alive for one minute. Standard of care is put them on medication for their disorder, especially in the United States. There's not one single randomized clinical trial that demonstrates that doing that keeps someone alive. So the standard of care has no data. Now, don't mistake no data for it doesn't work. It's altogether possible invitations do work and medications do work. So when something has no data, that does not mean it doesn't work. It means we have no idea whether it works. So what's the data on DBT? The good news about being a researcher with a really great human subjects group is you're not required to do standard of care. And that's good because the standard of care are two things that, that for suicidal behavior that I actually have serious questions about. And I wanted to keep them out of, I wanted to try research where I wasn't doing standard of care. And one of the main things besides doing our entire treatment, one of our main focus is we don't, we rarely hospitalize anyone. You will see that we, a DBT therapist rarely puts a person in hospital, no matter how suicidal they are. It's not that we never do, by the way. I'm in favor of it sometimes. So DBT, this is the data. And as you can see, at that DBT, for the most part, pretty much cuts suicide attempts in half. And this is compared to our typical control conditions. And there's, never, there's not been any control condition that we have found, if you select subjects for being suicidal, that we have not found DBT doing better than a control condition at reducing the incidence of suicidal attempts. When you look at the percent of patients who go to an emergency department for suicide ideation, DBT is significantly better, meaning it's not by chance. If you look at the admissions into psychiatric inpatient admission for suicide ideation, you see a huge difference. While they're in treatment with a DBT therapist, not such a difference when they get out because they stay low, but not as low. This, the, this research that I'm giving you here is not my own studies necessarily. These are, these, some of this is my studies, but what I've done is put together the studies that have been done because DBT now has really been studied very broadly, and uh, not very broadly, but it's got about nine randomized trials. Not all of those are on suicidal people. So it also has other things that it reduces, but these are not the main uh, things that I want to talk about here, but it does reduce other things besides suicide. It actually seems to reduce somewhat the suffering of these individuals. So is it good therapy? A lot of people said that for years. Look, that's just good therapy. Any good therapy would have those results. So we compared it to expert psychotherapy. We actually did a study where we selected therapists for being experts who were non-behavioral experts. And we compared DBT to the experts. And we still found DBT cutting suicide attempts in half compared to experts. But I do want to tell you this. Expert therapy is a lot better than treatment as usual. If you've got a person that you know and love who's suicidal, look for someone with experience. An expert therapist is someone that other people, uh, other leaders, heads of hospitals and stuff like that, uh, heads of units, heads of clinics say is really good. And those are the people to go to. So get recommendations. That's my advice. OK, where are we now? We don't know how to reduce suicide rates within society or how to prevent suicide in the individual case. Even my research, if you saw, we still have suicide attempts. So we don't really have all the answers here. 
Our belief that we know how to reduce suicide risk, our fears of trying anything new, is keeping us from learning how to treat suicidal individuals. So the belief that we know what to do has kept us from learning because that belief has put demands on therapists to do standards of care that have no evidence. It's put um, IRBs, the people who can approve your research or not, in a position of requiring that when there's no evidence. Now you might ask how in the world have I done my research, by the way. I have put together large packets of evidence for review committees on the absence of evidence <laughs> for the position that they are taking. Treating suicidal behaviors by treating disorders has not been shown to work. If I had to pick the one research study that I think is one of the single most important studies that we need to do is we need to actually try this. We need to select highly suicidal depressed people and put them into a treatment that we know treats depression and see if when you treat depression in highly suicidal people, does suicide go down? That study has never been done. It's amazing. It's amazing. Treating suicidal behavior directly with behavioral interventions is promising with high risk. We know that. Not only my data, but other emerging data coming out. I started a, a strategic planning group for young investigators because I'm so determined to get suicide intervention research going. And I have a group of people that come in really from here in Europe once a year, every 18 months. Young people who want to do this kind of research but don't know how to get through human subject review, don't know how to do randomized trials, don't know how to write grants. I bring in a few senior people every year and a bunch of junior people. And I can tell you there are a lot of young people emerging. They're coming. They're on the way. And I do believe things are going to get better because these young people are, I think, going to step up the plate. And I think that we're on, just beginning to go on our way. So what should one do now? Bulls said, what should you do? So I want to say reach out and touch someone because I want to tell you some research. There's the only study that's ever been done that's shown that you can reduce suicide, that is death, being dead, is a study done by a guy named Jerry Motto back in 1976. And he took high risk for suicide people from an inpatient unit. And he took all the people who, when they, they all got referred, of course, for treatment when they left. And a great big group of them didn't go. And he took all the people who didn't get in treatment and randomly divided them into two groups. And then every couple of months, he had the attending psychiatrist on the unit. They sent a letter to these people that said something like, hi, how are you? I'm thinking about you. Hope things are going well for you. It was a non-demanding, supportive letter. Didn't even ask for a response. If the person did respond, they, um, in the next letter, said something about that response. And then they tracked suicide. Now, they sent these letters for about two years. And in the two years that they were sending the letters, they had significantly fewer deaths by suicide in the group who got the letters. So your take home message when you walk out of here is reach out and touch someone. And I do believe that is what we do know about suicide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Linehan. Uh, we'll now take questions. So again, work your way to the microphones at the side so you can share your question with the audience uh, and the production. Um, and while people are getting to the microphones, I have a question. You said that one of the things that you most want to be remembered for is to increase the skills and motivation of therapists to deal with su suicidal uh, patients. How, what's your vision of how to do that? What do you want to try to um, make happen in our therapeutic and scientific community 
to achieve that goal? Well, what I've done is I developed in the treatment that I developed a component of treatment called the DBT or the treatment team. And I set up a set of guidelines in the treatment team that say that the treatment team is not to come in and discuss the treatment of your clients, but it is to that your, cli your client's behavior is to come in to discuss your own behavior. And it works like a peer therapy group where the goal of the team is to improve the skills of the therapist. And it has been a daunting task, I must say, uh, to develop this because I discovered this not taught in any training program that I've ever heard of in the, in the world, really. <laughs> and um, I, I managed to get it into my treatment because I developed the treatment. I could define what the treatment was. And then I said, you're required to do this. And in a treatment that has that, it really is the treatment with the best data on suicide. And so I believe that, and we've worked a lot on a manual for how therapists can help each other. Because I think um, that's one of the most important parts. The other part that's really critical is the milieu in which therapists work and the infrastructure. And I don't know if most people know that most therapists in this country have bachelor's and master's degrees, work uh, with caseloads sometimes of 30 to 50, and um, have some training but very little continuing education, not a lot of supervision, and uh, have unbelievably stressful working loads. The, it, the, Mental health is the only area where the more educated you get, the less severe your clients are. Okay, so the people dealing with the suicide actually are the people with low education. And they treat all the people psychologists refuse to take, all the people we won't train because we say they're too serious for our students, all the people psychiatrists won't take. The psychiatrists take them because they're required to take them, but the, but the, um, so it's really an amazing factor, you know, because you don't see that in oncology. The more serious the cancer, the better trained your physician. The more serious age, you go to the best. This is the only area where the more serious you are, you get a bachelor's, you could get a bachelor's level therapist. Not that they're not fabulous, but they don't have the training or the support. So we'll start question over here. So you said 11 out of 100,000 people commit suicide who are not diagnosed with mental disorders? Sorry, if, I, if, that, if you thought I said that, I didn't mean to say that. I meant that of the whole population, many of whom are not diagnosed with mental disorders. Okay, what um, factors or events motivate them to attempt or commit suicide? Well, that's a broad question. <laughs> I, you know, generally, uh, Ed Schneidman said it best that it's, uh, that the major motivation for suicide is, he used the word perturbation, it's the, it's the anguish, it's the inability to solve a problem, it's the inability to deal with something. Now, there's another whole group of people who kill themselves for none of the above. They do it impulsively. It's, it might be up to a third of people who kill themselves who haven't thought about it for longer than five minutes before they did it. The way we know this is that CDC did research on um, people who didn't die but for the grace of God. And they found a significant portion of them who actually had never considered suicide. They did it very impulsively, but they were, it was impulsive behavior. Okay, take a question over here. I have an easy question and a hard question. Um, the easy question is there were a couple of terms that I don't think have actually been um, defined in either of these talks, and one of them is suicide ideation, and the other one is high risk for suicide. I know you talked about how just because people have attempted suicide many times, they're not necessarily the ones you're looking for. Um, my second question is about your therapy, which you said why don't you let me do the first okay, question? Okay, do the first one. And then you can. All right. Okay. Suicide ideation is really a great question because, of course, people don't agree on any of this. But suicide <laughs> ideation really means ordinarily thinking about all the way from thoughts of suicide go through my mind to I'm thinking about it every day all the time. So it can be severe and not severe. And far more people think about suicide than ever kill themselves. Okay. 
but high risk for suicide, a previous suicide attempt is the best predictor of suicide. So that is the highest risk. You can't get more high risk than, the, than, than having a history of a suicide attempt. Because it, the basic rule in life is past behavior predicts future behavior. And so that's your single highest risk. Then you just add in disorders that are associated with suicide and you get even higher risk. And so there are a lot of things that go into equating risk. We're very, we're very reasonably okay about high risk in groups and very poor at high risk in individuals. But past behavior is the best predictor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and my other question is about the therapy um, which you said is different from treating the disorder. Ah, uh, yes. And so I'm wondering, since you talked about having to address all the different problems your clients have, I'm wondering how you differentiate that from treating the disorder that they oh, have. Oh, it's a totally fabulous question. Okay. Be the, the way we do it is that we come in and we're constantly monitoring suicidal behavior. So we're monitoring suicide, or the urge to kill themselves, thoughts of killing themselves, and any uh, intentional self-injury. And whenever that happens, we immediately analyze the behavior, suicidal behavior, and then look for what's associated with that. So we don't walk in with, you've got the disorder, we'll treat that. We walk in with, you've got the behavior, and then we'll look for the disorder that surrounds it. And it's idiosyncratic. One person's maybe trying to kill themselves because they're so depressed and they're hopeless and they can't stand it, or they have PTSD and it's unmanageable and unbearable. And another person is trying to kill themselves because they hate their wife, and they, but they don't, can't get divorced for some reason. And they don't want to live with them anymore. Or, I mean, it's not that simple, obviously. But, or uh, for many other reasons. So the, the, the question is, what is it that's driving this individual? So the treatment is like suicide-centric. You go to the suicidal behavior and constantly go from there. Well, thank you all for your questions. And join me one more time in thanking Dr. Nathalie. <laughs>